there's an incredible new video documentary on the Jeju 737 Korean Airlines jet disaster flight 2216 put out by KBS, the Korean broadcast service, public TV in Korea, that is far better than the cursory pre preliminary report that we got from officials in Korea. By using an incredible analysis of closed circuit TV video, they were able to recreate the accident and provide a much more accurate timeline as to exactly what happened. It's Wednesday, the 14th of May. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And this video is brought to you by viewers like you that support this channel here on Patreon. Thank you for your support. The Jeju Air Flight 2216 disaster occurred back in December of 2024, 29 December 2024, killing nearly everybody on board the aircraft, only two survivors, a total of 181 fatalities. After the 737 struck birds on final while initiating a go around and then attempted to land in the opposite direction and struck the localizer antenna berm off the end of the runway, killing nearly everybody but two on board that aircraft. We've done several updates on this disaster here on the Blanco Lirio channel. And remember when this aircraft crash landed in the opposite direction there at Muan, the gear was retracted, the flaps were up, and it appears that only the right engine was partially operational. And here, as he's skidding down the runway, heading towards the localizer antenna, we can see the reversers actuated on the right engine indicating that there is some power coming out of the right engine but there was no power coming out of the left engine the birds that the aircraft hit are the Baikal teal about a one pound duck migratory duck that unfortunately migrates right through where this airport has been developed in South Korea and when these ducks move they operate in huge flocks flowing more like a wave than a, a, a series of individual birds. And at the time of the accident, a huge flock of these birds was heading right towards the final approach course of where the 737 was coming into land. And now we have the actual video from closed circuit TV of the bird strike itself, thanks to the Korean broadcast system, public broadcasting there in Korea. And here you can see the wave of birds. Here's the 737 approaching. He starts a go around. Then he hits the birds and the number two engine compressor stalls multiple times. The number two engine, the engine on the right. This aircraft is heading towards us, flies through the huge flock of birds. And it's presumed that I I believe you can see a, a bunch of birds falling out of the bottom of this of this formation. That's either smoke out of the engine or smoke and bird parts coming out of the number two or right engine. And you can also see the birds getting swept up into the wingtip vortices of the aircraft as well. Look at it just move the whole flock of birds. And also by viewing this closed circuit TV video plus the transcripts from the tower, they were able to determine that the aircraft had initiated the go around seconds before this impact and the aircraft was actually on an ascent climbing when they struck the birds. And then the aircraft began to descend after impact as shown on the lower screen. So from their research using the closed circuit TV data, tower data and some limited CVR data, the Korean broadcast system has come up with a much more accurate timeline of events than what was originally portrayed in the preliminary report. So first we have 857.50, the tower reporting to the pilots, caution bird activity. Skipping ahead to this video over here, we see that the impact was at 858.26. Just 36 seconds after the tower warned of the bird activity. Now, based on the aircraft beginning to climb in the video and perhaps some information from the CVR data before the CVR went in up, it looks like the pilots initiated a go around 
just 15 seconds prior to impact. So the tower warns the pilots of the birds. The pilots see the birds, see that it's a huge flock or wave of birds that they're not going to attempt to fly through and land through. By the way, at this point that they impact the birds, they're just some 750 feet above the ground. So 15 seconds prior to impact, they initiate what appears to be a go around, and then at 8.58.26, they impact the birds. 24 seconds after impact, the CVR goes in op. More on that information later on. And then sometime later, 30 seconds after impact, the crew says, mayday, 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 bird strike going around. And this is a point of massive confusion in the investigation. That's what got us all questioning the judgment of the pilot. Why would you want to go around after you've hit, a, hit, hit the birds? Well, it was confusing to us because the pilot was reacting to the situation at hand. And as should be the case, Aviate, Navigate, Communicate. He did his communicating last. He did his communicating 30 seconds after the impact. And he's doing memory items before he deals with uh, saying mayday on the radio. So it looks like he did initiate a go around first, then struck the birds. Then the CVR went in op. And then he declares a mayday that he struck the birds and he was going around or he struck the birds on or during the go around. Now using the data from the reconstructed closed circuit TV video data, investigators at the KBS found that this aircraft went a much further distance than was originally believed before returning to land in the opposite direction. So first they found that the aircraft did climb a bit after they went around it disappears out of this frame and then descends back into the frame of the closed circuit TV. And they did so by triangulating all the data from the closed circuit TV videos and um, straightening them out for a fisheye view of the lenses. They went out and got personal firsthand accounts of eyewitness reports of the aircraft flying very low just prior to the crash landing. And with all this data, plus the ATC audio from the tower, they were able to re make this reconstruction. So first, the tower directs the uh, Jeju jet to go runway heading to 5,000 feet for their go around, not realizing the gravity of the situation. And of course, the aircraft was originally doing the straight into runway 01, but did a turnaround and landed on runway 19. So at first, the pilots communicated that they wanted to do a left 360 and come around and do a left downwind for runway 01. Realizing they didn't have the speed or the altitude to do that, they quickly abandoned that plan. 20 seconds later, the crew came up with another plan to do a right pattern to a right downwind to runway 01. But soon abandoned that plan as their energy state continued to decrease. At this point, the aircraft has descended to just 50 meters or only 164 feet above the ground when they try this dangerous maneuver, really fighting for their lives at this point to bring this aircraft around in a right, nearly 180 degree turn to bring it back around and land on runway 19. So, it's a good thing that the gear and the flaps wouldn't work on the aircraft because they certainly would have ended up short of the runway had they lowered the gear or the flaps. So the crew from the Korean broadcast system went into the full motion Boeing 737 simulator to recreate the scenario and they did the scenario, well first they did the scenario with both engines just off and, and just crashed almost immediately. Then they tried it the rest of the scenarios with the left engine off, which it was for the entire sequence of events, again, as soon as that, when that left engine shut down the CVR, that's when it ended. But then they tried the scenario with 50% power on the number two or right engine and still came up short. But once they started adding a little bit better than 50% power on the number two engine, they were then able to just barely make it back around and land on runway 19 with the gear retracted and the flaps up. 
and each of these scenarios were started with a go around push of the toga button prior just 15 seconds prior to the impact with the birds now at the risk of getting a big copyright strike from youtube i'm going to replay the video reconstruction that the korean broadcast service put together using a very accurate timeline and taking all of these closed circuit tv videos and putting them together to recreate the flight Voices you hear are um, recreated voices on the radio communications. Compressor stalling of the right engine. No power out of the left engine. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Jeju 2216. Go strike, go strike. Going around. Jeju 2016 was maintaining running, heading climb to 5,000. Running 85,000, Jeju 2216. Jeju 2 traffic say your intention. Stand by. Oh, tower Jeju 2216. Jeju. 레프턴 해가지고 곧바로 램프 인하겠습니다. 또 랜딩 하도록 하겠. 제주 캡처하십시오. 랜딩 가능하시겠습니까? 오늘 이거 잠깐 스탠 발사. So they want to try a left downwind to come back to zero one. Plan A. So they turn away. Still producing power on the number two engine. Right, sir. Zero one, we're going to take off. Then, then two two one five, turn right turn. Eight four, eight four, two two five, two two one five, right turn off. So now plan B, they want to try that right downwind back to runway 01. The aircraft continues to descend down to just 50 meters. Getting very low over the village, some distance away from the airport. But look at that descent there on the left. Look how low they come over. Did it to Yes, stand by. One nine, one nine. Jet two two one five, you mean one nine or wind con clear to end? Clear to end, runway one nine. They have no choice now but to bring the crippled aircraft back around and land opposite direction one nine. Come down, come down, come down, come down. Come down, come down. Oh, come down, come down. Still producing power on the right engine only. No gear, no flaps. Right back here. Right 
back here on this screen, we can see that we're only producing power out of the number two engine. We can see the exhaust out of the number two engine, the right engine, but nothing out of the number one engine. Floating in ground effect sends the airport, sends the aircraft sailing way down the runway and eventually into the poorly designed localizer berm, concrete berm located off the end of the runway. So we can hear the, well, we can hear the engine, the airplane scraping along the runway and some power being produced by the right engine and the thrust reverser is open in the right engine. Indicating that there was still some power being produced by that engine. Regarding the loss of the cockpit voice recorder and data recorder on board the aircraft, we've been through that before on previous episodes here on the Blanco Lirio channel. In an unfortunate design of the 737, these critical emergency items are located on the main buses. So if you lose the main buses, i.e. you lose the left engine and then the right engine is so severely damaged that it's no longer producing electricity, or hydraulic power, you're going to lose those components, the CVR and the data recorder. You're also going to lose your ability to lower the landing gear if you've lost the hydraulics. You could only lower the, hydro the landing gear using a manual landing gear extension, which is a very long and slow and tedious process by pulling cables located behind the co-pilot seat. And also your ability to lower the flaps if you've lost your hydraulic pressure from your two engine driven hydraulic pumps and no electric driven hydraulic pumps, you would have to use an alternate flap extension system using the what's left of the electrical system, which would be a very long and slow process as well. So what happened to the number one engine? We don't quite know yet, but information is being leaked out now. Remember, there's 24 seconds from the time of the impact with the birds until the time that the CVR data goes in op, 24 seconds. And according to some leaked information, that CVR did record the pilots shouting master caution and cut off just prior to the CVR going in op. Now it's believed that the term cutoff is in reference to the fuel control switches located right here below the throttles on the 737. So did the number one engine fail on its own due to the bird strike or did the crew shut down the number one engine in response to an engine severe damage or separation checklist memory items where step number three is to cut off the fuel? Or did the crew inadvertently shut down the left engine when they meant to shut down the right engine, the one that was producing all the compressor stalls and surging? Did they shut down the incorrect engine? And after watching this broadcast, I'm beginning to wonder, did the crew consider this? Did they just naturally, instinctively through rope memory, jump to the checklist, the memory item for loss of thrust on both engines and cut off both engines and then realize that their error and then reinstate the fuel to the number two engine or reinstate the fuel to both engines and only got the number two engine back. We just don't know at this time. Thank you so much for your support of this channel. All the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.